we're really fortunate to have Ben here to close out the uh, the conference. You know, Ben is uh, an entrepreneur and an operator. He's the CEO of Group Nine. He's an investor, a partner at Layer Hippo, and a keen observer of all things in the tech world. So let, let's just start with something that has been on my mind recently, which is you know the the the, the situation in, in Saudi Arabia, the the alleged murder of this journalist. It's a it's a crisis for global relations. It's potentially a crisis for the energy markets. And do you think, is it a crisis for tech considering how prominent uh, an investor the Saudis have been through their public pension fund in the, the biggest tech companies of this age? Right, well, let's start light. Thank you with that. Um, <laughs> we're, so, going, we're getting yeah, right in. Uh, well, I, you know, and, and we chatted a little bit about this backstage. I, I think uh, the reality is there's probably a lot of money in a bunch of big tech companies and, and, and big companies in general that uh, if you really sort of looked at, people might be uncomfortable with. So on the one hand, I think that, uh, that, that that sort of a bunch of people know that and don't really want to talk about it. Obviously, when you have a crisis like this and people start to sort of shine a light on it, um, you'll probably see some, some folks uh, want to push them out of their companies um, in some way, shape, or form. Um, to make a statement for what they believe in. Um, I think at the end of the day, though, uh, like the money will find its way there one way or another. Um, sort of money tends to do that, and people really need investors and need capital. And so I, I don't think that, that things will really change all that much. I think there'll probably be a lot of attention in the short term. Um, maybe there should be a lot of attention in the short term um, and in the long term, but I tend to think that at the end of the day, uh, like it'll find its way back into the ecosystem. And the way it has found its way into the ecosystem uh, lately has been via SoftBank. You guys at Lair Hippo are, are early stage investors, but has, the, has that massive influx, those $100 billion funds, pushed other investors into your space? What are you, what are you guys seeing in early stage? Well, it's actually, there's, there's so much activity right now in the late, late stage. Like it, I feel like money is growing on trees if you have something that is really working, um, and, and we see this every day. Just, just enormous valuations, huge amounts of company being uh, money being plowed into private companies that are sort of waiting longer and longer to go public. For us, uh, what I like about our model, we just sort of put our head down and keep doing what we're doing. And fluctuations in the market uh, don't have all that much effect on us. We're betting on on people, um, and the idea is the you know the economy is going to be hot or it's going to be cold, but there's always going to be really smart people with really interesting ideas. And um, if, we, if we don't let uh, those fluctuations bother us, I think uh, sort of over an extended period of time, we're, we're gonna be just fine. So you're betting on people, but are there uh, particular sectors that are interesting to you guys? Well, there's, there's stuff that we feel like we know uh, a bunch about. And generally speaking, we, our focus is, is one that, that sort of centers around New York. And so we tend to like the stuff that New York is really good at. Um, and New York's good at a lot, but uh, but retail um, and fashion, uh, media is sort of the thing that we're, I guess, best known for, um, specifically digital media. Um, but but really sort of sector agnostic is the way that we think about investing and really do focus on, on people and, and just this very simple idea, which is that uh, anything that sort of technology is not totally flipped on its head is just going to get flipped on its head. And so keep uh, we, we keep looking at areas that we feel are sort of have either not been really disrupted or have been disrupted once and then got a little, you know, we're now into sort of the second and third cycle of certain industries. And so uh, I'm not, uh, you know, we're going to be New York focused. And I think, you know, with VC firms in general, the, 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 the inclination is raise as much as you can. You're successful and you can raise a bigger fund, so you raise a bigger fund, so you, and then you're success, you know, theoretically successful and raise more and more, so you get more fees and more opportunity to earn. For us, uh, we're not really investors, we're operators, and so we don't want to do everything. We like the stage that we invest at. We can't, our funds are $120 million. We think our model breaks down if they get bigger, and so this is really what we want to do, and we want to keep. Uh, we want to stay at the, the sort of stage we're at. Uh, you didn't mention fintech. Uh, today we've, yes. talked, to, uh, yeah, yeah, we've talked to Robinhood and Coinbase and SoFi and, and so many other companies. I mean, do you still see there, is there opportunity or is this now, you know, basically? So I, I think, there, you know, we were, we were the first investors in Venmo, uh, you know, what feels like 100 years ago. That now. worked out quite well. Well, it's funny. It worked out 
because now everybody here knows Venmo and thinks it's amazing. Venmo actually sold well before it worked out. Uh, Venmo sold to Outbrain um, in, you know, everyone did fine, but Venmo is now a multi, would, would now be a multi-billion dollar company. And we didn't make Interesting. that, yeah, that <laughs> you wouldn't have known. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, and that, and that happens sometimes, right? Like, you know, timing plays a big role in this stuff, but we've made, we've made bets in, in fintech, certainly. I do think that, uh, and, and I, it's also worth noting that the way the partnership works is um, we have, you know, there's, there's four partners and everyone likes different stuff. I really like direct to consumer retail, like I like consumer in general. And so that's the stuff that I tend to focus on. And so I sort of speak for myself a little bit, not only the fund. How about cannabis? Come on. Uh, what's that's, not to like? At the cocktail part. No, uh, <laughs> I, I, we actually are investing in cannabis a bunch. Uh, we have not invested in the flower yet. So we've invested in um, the ecosystem. And so we're investors in a company called Vangst, which is in the recruiting space around cannabis workers. Uh, we're in a company called uh, LeafLink, which is a platform connecting uh, retailers and, and brands. Um, we're in uh, a media company called Herb. Uh, we've just invested in a, in a CBD company that's not yet, uh, not, no THC, but a, C, a CBD company that's not yet uh, announced. And we're, we really think it's, I mean, it's obviously a fascinating and, and sort of big industry. Uh, and I, I think we've been, we're, we're sort of finding our way through it, but uh, there's a bunch of opportunity, obviously. Uh, another question for investor Ben, and then we'll go to digital okay, great. media Ben. Uh, where, where are the ten billion dollar New York City startups? Why why do so many unicorns seem to be on the West Coast, and when will that change? Well, so that's an unfair question, and I and the reason I think that is, I remember five years ago when Tumblr sold, and like the entire story was New York was billion was dollar validation. company. Oh my God. Now we have billion dollar companies all the time. I actually, I, I think about the, uh, the Blue Apron IPO. The story was Blue Apron sucks, shitty IPO, not multi-billion dollar New York well, company. It, that's, it, it hasn't fared so well. well for okay, no, yet. you don't need to be rude, but like. Uh, <laughs> that, that, Can we pull up a chart? You're right, that's, that's true, but. But the point is, we've actually moved from the, the we've moved past the idea that billion dollar companies don't exist in New York. The ten billion dollar company, I think, is like that next hurdle, right? Which is we are waiting for, for sort of that next generation. But uh, you got to give it time. I mean, New York is is you know several decades behind the Valley, but the progress that New York has made is extraordinary, and there are companies. Uh, there's, there's tons of billion dollar companies now. And you know, to build a $10 billion company generally takes a really long time. Fair enough. Do, do you, New York is on the, the uh, short list for Amazon HQ2. Do you think it has a chance? I thought that Newark was on the short list. No, they list. both are. I don't think New York, it, I, I would be very surprised. I haven't heard that. I've heard that Newark was on the short list. It, it sounds like from everything I've heard that Washington DC is the, is it the sounds answer. Like the runner, yeah. But, uh, I hope it's not New York. Uh, uh, there's enough why? competition already yeah. for for great talent here, and uh, New York's not no. Yeah. Really okay, not, absolutely do not. Okay, come to New York, well let's please. let's talk uh, about digital media. You 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 are the founder of Thrillist and the CEO of Group Nine. Um, you know, 2017 got, was sort of known for being a bad year for digital media properties, with BuzzFeed laying people off and. Um, you know, problems at, at Vice and some other properties. Uh, it, is, is the narrative changing? Like a company that you invested in, Axios, is doing quite well. Yeah. So, so talk, tell me a little bit as we look at the global uh, unique visitors of online media companies, and it has plateaued somewhat, where do you see the state of digital global media? Global unique visitors of online media companies. That's a weird chart. Uh, uh, I, so the, the numbers don't lie. No, well, but the, well, the, the numbers don't lie, but that is, that's tracking owned and operated web properties of global media companies. And I think that is a... Well, the lines are blurring right now. The, I mean, I think they're more than blurring. I think that that's a, an antiquated way to look at uh, what a media company's audience looks like today. I mean, we live in a world now where there is, uh, you know, we think a lot about sort of this, this change from cable 
to, to new digital pipes. And so you go back and you look at the, you know, the sort of the cable business 35 years ago, you had this new pipe emerge and within, you know, call it 10 years, the launch of every major cable network that we all grew up with from ESPN to CNN to MTV to HBO, blah, blah, blah. They launched, they built these, you know, in some situations it was sort of an awkward phase to figure out the right content and, and to get these brands to scale. And then they consolidated and created the holding companies that, you know, that are the, the biggest media companies in the world. Fast forward, you now have powered by, you know, broadband and the smartphone, the, the rise of social. And while it's not a singular pipe, the social pipes between Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube are as powerful a, a sort of consumption engine as TV was for a different generation. And, and so the, what, what we're really excited about is the idea that um, these are pipes and on the pipes will be, is, it will be built the next great media brands. And so this accounts for traffic back to websites, but I think a lot of the most innovative and interesting media brands of tomorrow realize that uh, that's actually not an optimal user experience and you should go to where people are and where people are is not tracked in well but isn't that part of the problem because the relationship between uh media digital media brands and the and the social networks has been kind of unhealthy well right and i think you know you go back to television and tv advertising was bought from the brand and so you you don't buy from comcast you buy from bravo or from nbc you go to digital and the transactions are happening at the pipe level not at the content creator level and uh, that's been one of the sort of biggest challenges that has, has existed for these digital properties is the fact that the money doesn't go to them, the money goes to support uh, where it can be spent more scalably. Um, what we're starting to get to is uh, I think the pendulum is swinging. Um, now that now this sort of distribution, there, there is so much distribution, it's swinging back to premium content, it's swinging back to great brands. It's one of the reasons that a company like Axios is successful. They make awesome content. Uh, and, and so there's real value on that. Axios now has a, a show on HBO. Um, Axios um, is building direct relationships through the newsletters that they're building. Axios is building a big distributed business on the platforms that they're on. Uh, and so if you were to use this chart to, to sort of measure Axios, it would massively misrepresent how significant their audience well, I think, is. I think you made a key point, which is Axios has managed to appear in the inbox of its users. For the digital media company that is dependent on social media and Facebook in particular, yeah. is, you know, is, is, is Facebook a, you know, a, health, a healthy, is that a healthy dependence? Well, I, I think the, the, the definition of a dependence is sort of unhealthy um, in general. I think that Facebook is, uh, Ignoring the power of that audience, um, it is where it's sort of the sun in the in the you know the universe of where people spend their time online. Uh, I I think brands do that at their own peril. Um, I agree that the relationship um, can be trying, and that uh, you know Facebook is not in the business of making my life or your life or Axios's life easier. They're in the business of making money for themselves. Um, and part of why I'm really bullish about the future of, of how to build businesses with platforms like Facebook is that at the end of the day, fa the, the strength of Facebook is going to be um, the amount of time that people spend there and the quality of the interaction that they have. And premium content, and in particular premium video content, is the currency that they have to, to generate user engagement. And uh, there's more and more competition in the market. And not all that many people that make really great premium content. And I think we're moving to a, sort of a, uh, a market that favors the content creator, albeit not singularly for Facebook. Content creators who understand how to create a long tail of distribution, how to make, how to maximize dollars in from a, from a content creation perspective, to maximize dollars out from a sort of window distribution perspective, um, and multifaceted monetization. So direct sold premium advertising, backfill with the right uh, partner relationships at these various platforms, uh, content licensing into other windows, um, and ideally direct monetization of these audiences. And so I, I, I am kidding, I would be kidding you and would be kidding myself to say that this is an easy business. If you look at the relationship that media companies have with Facebook today versus a year ago versus two years ago, 
Two years ago was utter shit. There was almost no monetization at all. A year ago, you started to find some places where there was a revenue share and it was getting a little bit better. Fast forward another year, you now have some brands with their own sales rights representing their premium inventory. You have some guarantees coming in. You're starting to see, like, it's frustrating day to day and month to month, but if you actually look at it over the course of time and you put a pin in what's happened, uh, the relationships are getting much better. And there's a quote that someone said to me yesterday that I really liked, which is, the days are long, but the years are short. Um, on a day in, day out basis, it's incredibly frustrating and you feel like you're getting dragged this way and that. But if you actually look over time, um, the, the social platforms are meaningfully changing the way that they partner with and value premium content creators. But to some, like a Rupert Murdoch or Robert Thompson, not changing or going far enough. Well, and, and I understand that because they were uh, the beneficiaries of an exquisite, um, I mean, what an incredible business. With the, the carriage deals. Of, with the carriage deals and all that stuff. They I, want to replicate that. In the I don't blame them. I would love to replicate that. I think that um, the way to replicate that is going to be, uh, it's not going to be quite that straightforward. It's going to be about having to understand those audiences that you're building and monetize them directly as well as indirectly. Uh, and so I don't think that, uh, I think we're in the very early innings of this. I'm, the TV business as we know it is clearly not gonna be the TV business. Uh, the, the, the great health in that ecosystem is not gonna continue. That business is gonna get harder. Um, more and more money as audiences leave paid TV are gonna be moving to digital video. There's gonna be more money in these ecosystems for content creation uh, and for these brands. But this is a long game, and, and our strategies in, as investors is a long-term strategy, and my strategy at Group 9 has to be a long-term strategy, which is to build the next great generation of media brands. It's, it's not going to be easy every day. It's getting a little bit easier, but I still feel like I get punched in the gut 10 times a week, and if next week I get punched nine times, that would be really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> are, are the accumulated crises of 2018 for Facebook, are, are they existential? Um, I think I that mean, could Facebook go away is what I'm asking? No, absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not. Facebook is not going away, um, or not even close. Um, it, will, it will change a lot. Um, I think that they've been brilliant in how acquisitive they've been, obviously buying Instagram and WhatsApp and these other platforms. And they're like, I think that, that Mark is... Um, is steps ahead of a lot of us uh, in, in how he sort of thought about that. Um, Facebook is is really strong. I think that for a long time they could do no wrong. And, uh, you know, like gravity is a thing. Like what goes up must come down always. They're having their, their moment. Um, like, you know, any great big company goes through hard times. I think at the end of the day, this is, if you really still, the growth is still extraordinary and enormous and insane. It was just a place that could literally do no wrong and now everyone's piling on. But long term, I'm a, I'm a massive believer in Facebook. I think it's one of the five most important companies in the world and smartest companies in the world. And like, you know, if I had money that I want to put away, I would put it away in Facebook stock. Is, is Twitter a meaningful a partner or source of traffic for the for increasingly, the yeah. Twitter has done. Uh, I think Twitter has really capitalized on some of the some of the sort of drama um, amongst their competitive set and has had a really good year. Um, they've been they've they followed suit in in massively prioritizing video, in prioritizing partnerships. Obviously, Bloomberg has built a really interesting one in TikTok. Uh, we've we've found them to be really. Uh, smart, good partners. It's very interesting spending time with Twitter. It feels like so much more of a sort of manageable, smaller business than a place like Facebook. It's funny how Facebook and Twitter get compared. I think they're, you know, Twitter is, a, is, is so much smaller from an infrastructure perspective, which actually in many cases makes them a really good partner um, because they, uh, you can sort of talk to the powers that be they communicate with each other in a, in a pretty functional way. Um, they have a very clear strategy. 
Facebook is doing so many things. They own so many applications. They own so many businesses. They're, um, they're so multifaceted that I think one of the challenges that Facebook has right now is just one of internal communication. Um, not external communication, but internal communication. And the world that we live in is such that uh, there are no secrets anymore. I mean, there are literally no secrets anymore. The things that happen uh, inside a company with their workforce um, find their way out, particularly as you have a very big workforce who lives on a social application. And I think that that sort of has, you know, like comms and HR and these things are all intermingled in crazy ways now. And, and if you think about, uh, that's, that's challenging for a company that's growing faster than almost any company in the history of mankind. Twitter is a little bit more under control and maintained, um, and I think growing in a really smart, steady way, and uh, I, you know, it, it's a very, uh, I think it's a really important, and a really important company. I wouldn't be surprised if someone bought it. Uh, because who, I, who would be a natural partner? Natural well, partner. there's, you know, look at like the, you know, the 10 biggest media companies in the world, or I'm sorry, 10 biggest tech companies in the world. They all have like, you know, the, the, the money between the couch cushions to go do that kind of a deal. An Apple or a... Totally. I, th I, I just think that it's a really interesting target because it's a, uh, I think it's a stellar product. I think it is, uh, it's, it's the foundation of a huge number of people's digital lives. And, uh, uh, you know, it, I, I think it's going to be very successful as an independent company, but I think it could, it could roll into a strategy for one of these behemoths as well.